when the law of man conflicts with the law of God, it's at that point that you will see exactly whose God is real and whose God is merely theoretical. So here we see this man, Daniel. Now, remember last week we said that he is in his early 80s right now. He's at the minimum 81, 82, perhaps even 85. He is an elderly man. And not only is is he still in favor, but he still is in such favor and he's still doing such a tremendous work that he is now going to be elevated to the top position. So we see a picture here of a man who's truly finishing his race well. He's not just marking time. Now he's in his 80s. Boy, I sure have worked hard all these decades. It's time for me to take a rest. Instead, he's still going as strong as ever. He's finishing his race well. He is finishing his calling well. But also, we're going to see that he's going to have the greatest spiritual test of his life at the end of his life. Just like Jesus. Just like Abraham. He's going to have the greatest spiritual test of his life at the end of his life. So we see this man, Daniel, who has been prepared over all these centuries, or centuries, over all these decades for this final and this greatest spiritual conflict, the spiritual test that that will come to him. That means that what this says to us is that the spiritual tests of Daniel's life did not get any easier. And in the same way, so also the spiritual tests of our life, God does not intend for them to get any easier. His intention is that the successes that we have in spiritual trials will set us up for greater spiritual trials and greater spiritual trials and greater spiritual trials. Instead of saying to us, you know what, I've been faithful for so long, I have served God in all these ways. I'm now 80 years old. I'm 83 years old. Can it just be okay if I just sort of coast through this one? Here is the picture of Daniel who at the end of his life is not only still finishing running his race as hard as he can, but he will face the greatest of all spiritual trials and he's ready for it because God has prepared him over the years with lesser spiritual trials through which he was faithful then as well. So this is coming up here at the end of his life. Verse 3, this Daniel became distinguished above all the other presidents and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. Now, that excellent spirit, I take that to mean not like Holy Spirit, but I take that to mean excellent spirit as in excellent work ethic spirit. In other words, Daniel took his theology so seriously that his theology bled over into his work ethic. What he believed about God invaded over into how he worked in his position in the kingdom. His theology, his beliefs of God, his faith, if you will, informed the way that he carried out the work that he was assigned to do. He did just as Paul will say to the Colossians, Colossians chapter 3, bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. So Paul says, bond servants, those people whose time is literally owned by another person, work for that master, work for that person, Heartily, from the heart. No, not, not any eye service. Don't just do it just to get by. Instead, from your heart, work as though you are working for the Lord. Not that you confuse the two. Not that your master is the Lord. Daniel has no confusion here about Darius or Nebuchadnezzar or Belshazzar. But Daniel's belief, his theology, his faith has taught him That as he carries out his duties, he does that as unto the Lord. His work ethic is a work ethic unto the Lord. Now, this work ethic is what's going to get him in trouble, so to speak, because as we're going to find out, verse 4 again, the presidents and the satraps sought to find ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint or, or any fault because he was faithful. 
and no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Then these presidents and satraps came to an agreement, and here's where they're going to hatch the plot. So there's nothing like finding out who your enemies are, like a promotion that's coming, right? If you want to find out who your enemies are, just give, give a rumor to a promotion that's coming or some sort of advancement that's coming. And then you'll find out who your friends are and who your enemies are. And the same thing happens here with Daniel and these other satraps, these high officials here, is the king has plans to promote Daniel to the head. They find out about it, and that's what sort of keys them off. How we, how we handle the success of others around us has a direct relationship with our relationship with God. How we handle the success of those around us, how we treat that, how we receive the success, the promotion, the advancement of others around us speaks volumes about our relationship with Christ because our security with Christ speaks directly into our ability to be excited for others, to support others, to celebrate the success of others. Or if we have not that security in who we are in Christ, then the advancement of others we see as a threat. That's one of the hardest things for us as people to learn, right? That when others are advanced around us, if we see our value, if we take our value, our worth comes from other people or our position or our status, then the advancement of others around us is a threat to that. But Daniel sees this opposite. Daniel sees his worth. Daniel sees his identity in Christ, in his relationship with God. And so therefore, he's firm in that. But these others, they have no relationship with Christ, obviously, right? So Daniel is going to be promoted above them, and they see that as a threat to themselves. But Daniel has this work ethic that causes him to just excel in his duties that he's doing. Now, this, I think this reminds us, that doesn't this show us of, of just the power of working in whatever capacity God has given us, working to the glory of God. Just the ability that that has to be a witness to others, the, the power that that has for validating the gospel to others. When we work, when we carry out the capacity that God has given to us to the glory of God, we are not spreading the gospel. Sometimes you hear people say, well, I spread the gospel in, in the way I live or the way I treat people or the way I do my job. No, spreading the gospel means spreading the words of the gospel. Gospel is words. J.D. Greer puts it a great way when he says to speak the gospel without using words is kind of like giving somebody your phone number without using digits. You can't do it because your phone number is digits in the same way the gospel is words. So we don't spread the gospel by working with a work ethic that is to the glory of God. Instead, we validate the words that we speak. Our life can validate that. And Daniel's life validates the faith that he has and the words that he speaks. And by so doing, this is what has gotten him on a sideways track with those who are around him. Because this is, this is really where the rub is. The rub for Daniel and those around him is not so much that he has this different faith than they do. It's not so much that he has a different religion than they do. It's not so much that even the Daniel is religious and they're not. The rub is Daniel's total devotion to his God. Daniel understands his God to be the true, real, living, sovereign God. And because he is sovereign over all of life, Daniel's God, therefore, has things to say about how you carry out your work, how you carry out your life, how you treat others, how you do things how you live your life, so to speak. Because Daniel's God is the true God, is the, he's the real God, he's the living God, Daniel sees him as having authority and the right to direct all assets, aspects of your life. While those who are the Babylonians around him, or now the Persians around him, they worship gods that are not sovereign, not true, and not real, and deep in their heart they know them to not be. And so if your God is not sovereign, is not real, 
then He doesn't have a whole lot to say about how you live your life. Does that connection make sense? If your God is sovereign, and if your God truly lives, then He has much to say about how you do all aspects of your life. If your God is theoretical, then He has nothing to say about how you live your life. This is where the rubber really meets the road, and this is where Daniel and his companions are going to part ways. Because Daniel's God is sovereign and real and alive, and Daniel knows that. That therefore causes Daniel to live in ways that deep down are offensive to those who believe in theoretical gods and false gods. Because you can mark this down. When the law of man conflicts with the law of God, that's when you find out whose God is real and whose God is theoretical. When the law of man conflicts with the law of God, it's at that point that you will see exactly whose God is real and whose God is merely theoretical. Daniel's God is real. And so so therefore, Daniel lives in such a way that is offensive to those whose God is theoretical. In fact, they make it their job to cause him to sin against the God that he knows to be real. Do you, you know how the story is going to play out, right? The, the, the whole thing is centered on this prayer thing, that there's this prohibition against Daniel's prayer. And Daniel prays anyway. So their goal, their ultimate goal is to get rid of Daniel. But their interim goal is to cause Daniel to sin against his God. Why? Because their God is theoretical and therefore has little or nothing to say about how they may or may not live their life. When those around us worship the false gods of the day, our total devotion to a true God is what they find to be the most abrasive. You may have experienced this in your life. Or you may have seen it experienced in the lives of others around you. I can remember specifically a time uh, back in the Marine Corps when I remember uh, there were some other Marines that made it their mission to get me to say words that they knew I wouldn't say. It was just like that was, that was their mission to get me to say those words that I wouldn't say. Now that's just one example. You probably have had something like that happen to you or seen it happen to others where there is a particularly godly person and an ungodly person or a group of people. And the ungodly group of people make it their mission to cause the godly ones to stumble against the God that they worship. Why? Because their God is flexible and bendable because it's a God of their making. Meanwhile, Your real, true, living God, who is sovereign, is not. And that's the whole rub. Because when the laws of man conflict with the laws of God, we all find out whose God is real and whose God is theoretical. There's no greater example of that right now, that principle right now, than our current POTUS. I'm sure you've heard this. He's not the only one, but I'm sure you've heard it said how he as a practicing Catholic, believes abortion to be morally wrong, but doesn't believe that the right to do that should be taken away from people. I can think of no greater example of someone whose God is theoretical than that. The law of God conflicts with the law of man, and the one who has a theoretical God just bends the laws of God to match. But if your God is real, and if your God is sovereign, then that's where the rub comes. And that's where the rub has come with Daniel and his friends. Daniel, if Daniel were just merely religious, if Daniel were to say to Darius, hey, King Darius, can I just have every Sabbath off so I can go and worship, and then I'll be right back here next day. And Daniel goes and he worships a God and he believes that that's the only God, that all the other gods are false and made up, but yet he sort of keeps it there. 
there would have been no problem. Or they might still have been jealous of Daniel, but there wouldn't have been the same issue. Likewise, that's exactly what's happening in the world around us today. You have heard all the what's going on in our progressive society today in which the thing now is that you can believe what you want to believe, you can pray like you want to pray, just keep that personal. You have no right to bring that into the public square. Have you heard this? I mean, it's, it's all over the, everywhere today. Is that people are upset that Supreme Court justices would actually use their faith to make decisions and those sorts of things because you can have your faith, but just don't bring it into the public square. Just don't bring it into our public life. Keep that stuff private. Well, if your God is theoretical, there's no problem with that. But if your God is real, and if your God is alive, and if your God is sovereign, then it is impossible for you to keep that private. It must govern all of your life. It must govern the public aspects of your life as well as the private aspects of your life. And this is truly where the issue is between Daniel and those around him. The world around us will not tolerate true devotion to Jesus Christ. Do you know that the world really is... Sometimes we say, well, the world really gets upset if we say Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life, right? That's really not where the world gets so upset. You can believe Jesus is the only way, the truth, and life. Just don't be so devoted to them. That's where the whole rub goes. When that starts to invade all of your life and all of your thinking, that's where the ostracization comes. That's, that's where... That's where the issue comes about. So, this opposition that they're going to, that's going to come about, once again, we're in chapter, I'm, I'm sorry, verse 5. Then these men said, We shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Oh, that that could be said about me. Oh, that p- people who knew me could say, The only thing that we can find wrong about this guy is he ju- is just too obedient to God. Don't you wish that that was a testimony that all of us could claim? What a testimony for Daniel. The only thing we're going to get him on is if we somehow make obedience to his God illegal. Then we'll have him. Verse 6, Then these presidents and satraps came in a, by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom or all the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects, and the satraps, the counselors, and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition or any, to any god or man for 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. So here they come with their plot. The plot is we will declare it to be illegal to make petition or prayer to anyone but King Darius for, for 30 days. And notice how, of course, they're lying. All of the satraps, all of the officials are in agreement and we all know that one of them wasn't. Daniel, of course, wasn't in agreement. So they are misrepresenting, they're they're being deceptive to the king. And doesn't that just really gall you? Doesn't that really gall you when you're lied about? Doesn't it really get under your skin? Don't you just want to say, you know what, you can you cannot like me or you cannot like Christians or you cannot like our... But just don't lie about us. Just don't misrepresent us. Isn't that what you want to say? Let me try to give some words of help to that. Because it's really frustrating, isn't it? Nobody likes to be lied about. So some words to maybe help that would be this. Do you know that the kingdom of evil can only oppose the kingdom of good with lies? You realize that? You cannot oppose the God of truth with more truth. That's just a logical inconsistency. You cannot oppose truth with truth. You can only oppose truth with deception. And so the kingdom of evil will always oppose the kingdom of righteousness with lies. That's the only way that they can oppose. This is why Jesus would say to the Pharisees, you're like your father the devil. He was a liar from the start because that's all he could be. If you stand in opposition to the God of truth, then there's nothing you can do except to twist the truth. 
or pervert the truth or distort the truth or at least hide the truth. So maybe that can help with our frustration because it is frustrating to be lied about and to be misrepresented. I know I'm just like you. I don't like when people lie about me, but at least we can know if the kingdom of evil is going to oppose us, they have to do it with lies. So they do it with Daniel with these lies. They say everybody's in agreement. Let's make this Let's make this rule, this law for 30 days. You're the only one that can be prayed to. So I want to draw an analogy, a parallel here that's a stunning parallel. There's a parallel to what's happening in the king's chambers right now. And that parallel is the Garden of Eden. Because that's exactly what's going on in the Garden of Eden when the serpent comes to Eve and says to Eve, you can be God. Isn't that what they're saying to Darius? You can be God. For 30 days, nobody can pray to any... Oh, and make this rule that can't be changed. Because everybody knows that a rule that a God makes can't be changed. So they're coming to Darius in the same way that the serpent came to Eve and to Adam with this temptation. You can be God. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't you love to be God? Even for just 30 days, wouldn't that be nice? So they make this this proposal. Everybody's in agreement. Everybody's in agreement that you're the only one that should be prayed to for the next 30 days. 